trade heaven's riches for a stable in a manger. No, can it be great I am coming down to reach us? Morning star, let this dark world know. Here is the promised one, Jesus, our hope has come unto us, unto us, a child is born unto us, unto us, a son is given glory to God in the highest, wonderful Prince of Peace, Emmanuel has come to set captives free, with the angels we sing glory to God in the highest, he has brought this great love unto us. Who are we that a king would still walk among us, knowing he would only live to die? Cross of shame, crown of thorns, he still chose to carry. Beauty broken, breathing us new life. Here is the promised one. Jesus, our hope has come unto us, unto us. A child is born unto us, unto us. A son is given glory to God in the highest. Wonderful Prince of Peace, Emmanuel has come to set captives free. And with the angels we sing glory to God in the highest. He has brought this great love unto us. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. child is born unto us, unto us, a son is given glory to God in the highest, wonderful Prince of Peace, Emmanuel has come to set captives free, and with the angels we sing glory to God in the highest, yes brought this great love unto us. Welcome to worship with the Chula Vista Presbyterian Church. We pray that your holidays were joyous and that you remain healthy as we all look forward to 2021. If you are feeling lonely or if you know someone who is, is alone and needing to talk, please let us know. God cares about you and so do we. Join me now in the call to worship. In the cold of winter, we come to worship the Lord. In the darkness of isolation, we gather anyway to share the Lord's Supper. For we know that the light of the world has come. He is full of grace and truth. God has heard and answered our prayers. Jesus Christ brings salvation and hope to all. Together in a new year, in new ways, we worship and praise God. Let us sing together, O oh, come all ye faithful, number 41. O oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O oh, come ye, O oh, come ye to bed. Come and behold 
behold him born the king of angels oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him christ the lord of angels sing in exaltation sing all ye citizens of heaven above glory to God glory in the highest oh come let us adore him Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet Thee, born this happy morning. Jesus, to Thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore him in christ the lord oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him christ the lord We often think we are always in the right. Then something comes along to humble us and remind us that we need the Lord. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Almighty God, we confess that we too often trust in ourselves and fail to rest in you. In your mercy, forgive us our sin and create in us new hearts. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us with your perfect peace. Hear us now as we silently confess to you from the quiet of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone who isn't is in Christ, is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. As grateful people, we know that we are forgiven and free. Let us be at peace. And let us sing together, Lo, how a rose air blooming, number 48.
Testament reading is from Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7 and 10 through 11. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures, and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. May the kings of Tarshish and of the isles render him tri tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations give him service. Today is Epiphany Sunday, and our scripture reading is from Matthew 2, beginning at the first verse. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? Note, this was Herod's title. But anyway, it says, the wise man said, we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened or troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Calling together all chief priests and the scribes of the people, Herod inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the lands of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men, and he learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star at its rising. They had seen it, and it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another way. And then we'll skip ahead a little bit to verse 16. It says, When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was furious, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or younger, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men that the star had appeared. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. This ends the reading, and we are grateful for it. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts being delight to you and draw us closer to you, our Redeemer. Amen. Well, that's a familiar story. As we have spoken, this is the last of the stories of Christmas. And it has one important lesson for us, is that there can be too many kings. Or maybe, as the Bible would say it, there is only one true king. We certainly experience that sometimes at Christmas, our family, for the first time in 138 years, was unable to gather as a Scottish clan to celebrate Christmas together. 
We have a lot of stories passed down through those years. We wear our kilts and listen to bagpipes and dance and eat well. But there is one year, about 35 years ago, when we decided not to go to a restaurant or hire a caterer. Being good Scots, we decided to do it ourselves in the church hall for free. Now, there were multiple ideas about when and how to cook the turkey, but suffice it to say, it was still not ready three hours after dinner was supposed to have started, and we had a lot of hungry and irritable people. One of the men summed it up this way, too many kings can ruin an army. Yes, we all knew he meant too many cooks can spoil the broth, but he was smart enough not to go after the women and our best efforts. But also, believe it or not, he was quoting Homer in the Iliad. Homer writes that Odysseus said, too many kings can ruin an army, let there be one commander and one master only. That person is the person who gets all the glory or all the blame. There is a reward to getting a job done. There's a feeling of competence, there's honor and respect, and the right to continue and remain in power. You see, human beings delight in power. With power comes lots of good perks, and people appreciate the perks as much as that feeling of control. And the Christmas story is, according to N.T. Wright, a story really about power and God's breaking into our earthly domain and letting us know that he alone is in charge. This Christmas story is a wonderful story for all time. We enjoy telling it, we sing it, we share it, and even dress up our children. Even this year, we watch on TV the many nativity stories. And we remember fondly the warmth of that traditional story. We cherish the idea that God was born as an infant to live every day and every way like us. God submitted himself to a humble life, just like you and me, but he was still God, Lord of the universe, the King of the Jews. And so as the angels pounded out that glorious chorus and the sky shone brilliantly, one particular star shone above the earth, above the place where Jesus was born, where the fabric of history was pierced by its maker. And so in these stories, we learn that that nice, warm telling has an awful ending. The sages from the Eastern Kingdom saw that star and followed it to its place over Judea. Some say the star was in the constellation of the lion, which represented Judah. Others say it was a comet or an unusual starry roadmap. But clearly these foreigners were astronomers who watched the sky and they understood it to mean that there was a new and great king born in Israel. This was an expectation not just in the skies, but in literature. And this would be not just any king, but a king who would be greater than all kings. So these wise men followed the star and they went straight to the royal palace in Jerusalem because that's where the king lived. This was a surprise to horrible Herod. Herod thought he was king of the Jews and he claimed to be the greatest. But more importantly, Herod was very paranoid and protective of his own rule. He enjoyed power. It was unthinkable of him to think that another, even the Messiah, would come on his watch. During Herod's reign, he faced lots of trouble within his own family. He had killed his wife, Mariamne, because he was afraid she would marry another and replace him. And three of Herod's sons were put to death just because they threatened the throne. It is said that his brother escaped death only by dying first. But like many people with a strong will to power, Herod could not face the thought of losing it. He ruled by fear, 
but that means that fear really ruled him. He was afraid of many things, losing his throne, just the change that comes with time, and of course, death and the end of his own life, particularly if the new king had ideas about the throne that Herod had. If Herod was afraid, so was the whole town of Jerusalem, because too many kings can ruin an army, or a town, or a kingdom. This could not turn out well. There could be only one king. But what Herod didn't see was God's hand in this news. Who knows what might happen when the true king was on the move? We all know from history or times of change that it can be a good thing to have a new ruler. Cyrus the Great of Persia brought human rights to the Middle East, and he allowed the Jews to return to their homeland after their exile. And even the Roman Emperor Constantine became the Holy Roman Emperor. He made it official to believe in Christ as your Savior. And our favorite, being people of the English language, is James I of England. He settled religious and royal disputes in England for a time anyway, and he kept Great Britain out of European wars. But mostly, he authorized a new English version of the Bible, which we call the King James. Each leader, whether great or difficult, had a calling for a time, a single human lifetime. And while we no longer have kings as such, we do have leaders and rulers of influence in the world. And they live only one short span in the heartbeats of which they can either choose to do good or choose to create conflict and chaos. And we forget that all humans in history, all of human history is in the hands of God, the one and only king who entered history to change it from the inside out. That is the child of Bethlehem that we celebrated this Christmas. And this is the greatest change of all because God went to battle with sin and evil. And even our fears of change can be remedied by the reconciliation through his son. People in authority will do what they will, but the Lord of it all joined us to save us from raw human power. Now, Herod knew that anyone claiming to be the king from David was throwing down a challenge, and power and change would shake his sense of control, but it would also serve the ultimate will of God and would work out for our salvation. You see, the wise men had a different approach. They welcomed God's presence, they humbly sought to understand the meaning of the star, and they pursued it. Herod, on the other hand, resisted God's presence, and though he had the keys to understand it in Scripture, he chose to do evil as he had in other times. But what I love about the wise men not being afraid of change was that as they sought the child, they were directed not just to the assumed royal base of Jerusalem, but to the scriptures where they would be told the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. And we too must rely on holy scriptures in times of change as well as in all of our lives. We want to find the Savior and know him better, and we can give more hearing to God and less hearing to the loud voices all around us that would rule our emotions or affect our choices. Those voices in and of themselves can be like kings, ruining an army, even just within us or a community. But we, like the wise men, can study the word of God and pray as we follow God. We can allow ourselves the joy of discovering God and offering him our gifts, whatever they are. And God reveals himself to us and then speaks to us in guidance, as he did to the wise men. You know, on Christmas Day, 
there was the potential for terrible tragedy in Nashville, Tennessee. There was a lonely and isolated man who had his own internal voices and he decided to do evil. But what I loved as I listened to the uh, interview of the police officers who answered the call to address this bomb threat in downtown Nashville was their story of how God led them. They did everything they were trained to do, get the people out and clear the area, but then they weren't sure. And one officer, Officer Mills, Officer Wells, excuse me, he was right by the RV that was about to blow up. And he heard, he said in his telling to the reporters, I heard the voice of God. And it said, go back, turn around and be with Officer Hosey. Officer Hosey herself, not a believer, said she also heard a voice telling her to get out of the way, to change her direction and be with Officer Wells. Well, they were right, because right after that, the RV exploded in a brilliant um, color of orange and loud noises. Wells was thrown from his feet, but he suffered only minor injuries because he had stepped away and turned his back. And he and Officer Hosey ran to each other and held on tight. As they said, they held tighter than they'd ever held on to anyone before because Officer Wells said, I heard the voice of God tell me to change my direction. That's a powerful story and we wish it for ourselves, but we listen as the wise men of old were told to change their minds, change their direction, and go home another way. What seemed like a detour was the guiding hand of protection for the wise men, for the baby, for Mary and Joseph. They were all led away from the damage that would be done by an evil king trying to ruin an army or a kingdom. You see, we don't follow people. We don't follow events. We follow the Lord. He is God of all and the only true king worthy of our obedience. And we must also listen and obey. When we read ahead in the next verses in Matthew, that wonderful warm nativity story turns dark and cold because we then learn of Herod's awful plans. He refuses to receive God's chosen king and he chooses conflict over peace. He orders the death of all infants born in Bethlehem under two years old, thinking that he can eliminate the one true king. This recalls the cringe-worthy order of Pharaoh to kill the Israelite babies in Egypt during the time of Moses. But God's will marches on, and humanity cannot defeat it. Even though there is still bad news now, and we hate to hear of suffering and death. We might even be paralyzed by fear when bad news happens. Change comes hard and we resist our own rescue. But we learn in this story to hold on, to see what God will do because God's presence will become the greatest act of any ruler of any time. You see, Death did pursue that baby in Bethlehem. Years into the future, that baby, who Joseph knew as Emmanuel, God with us, that baby as an adult willingly offered himself as evil and darkness tried to do its worst to him. This one king who is known as Jesus, the Savior, becomes the one king who ruins the army, armies of sin and darkness. And this one king who is known as the Lamb of God, the only perfect and worthy sacrifice for you and me, he is the only one who proves that he holds authority over all, even life itself. Jesus in his life defeated illness and ignorance. 
In his death, he defeats betrayal and abandonment, mob rule and Roman power. Finally, Christ the Lord defeats suffering, sin, and death. And the baby of Bethlehem brings peace and reconciliation with his resurrection to new life. As the disciple John writes in the book of Revelation, Christ is the only king worthy of our worship and our trust. And when we let him rule our lives, fear has no power, change has no hold. He is the one true king, the only king, who cares for us and his power works for us. Because all of us in our own way can either be like Herod or like the wise men. If we're like Herod, we choose fear and self-preservation. We deny Christ's lordship and end up hurting others. But if we are wise, like the kings from the east, we choose to learn, to trust, and to follow God into a new way and into a new year. This is my prayer for you in the coming days. Thanks be to God. Join me now in our affirmation of faith in reading the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen.
the baby of Bethlehem, God with us, grew up to be Jesus the Christ, or as we now know him, the King of Kings. And before his betrayal, before he went to his death on the cross, he invited his disciples to feast at a table of Passover. And he said, this is my table. You are all welcome to come to it. Men and women will come from north and south from east and west, and sit at this very same table in the kingdom when I return. This is not just a Chula Vista table or Presbyterian, but it is for you and for me and all who put their trust in Jesus as their Savior. And so I invite you to prepare your juice or wine and your bread as we pray together. Lord God, we lift our hearts to you in thanks and praise, for you deserve all glory and honor. You are the one true king who loved us so much you gave your life to save us. And so we gratefully come to you in thanksgiving for this meal and the promise of your return, the hope not just of our salvation, but of our new life after this life, forever with you and all loved ones. We remember those who suffer throughout the world, whether it's poverty or hunger or lack of a roof over their heads. And we also know that the world is still in the clutches of a terrible pandemic. And so we pray for all who are ill, both far and near, even among our own congregation. Heal us, we pray. Protect us from continued illness. And may we always look to you in these times of disruption and change. Lord God, we pray for a new year and a new hope, a new outlook on the life you give us, which is new in Christ. We ask that you teach us to love our enemies. Help us to love our families even when they test us. And also, Lord, be with us, loving us, for we too are lonely and lost. May we be reflections of your grace in the world. We pray for those who are bereaved, or missing, lost, lo missing loved ones this holiday. Give them comfort and welcome friends to talk to, to be with. And Lord God, we especially ask that you watch over this church, even as we're apart, we're together for this meal, as we are together in you. And we ask that you teach us to open our eyes to those on the edges of our vision who are lost or lonely alienated or confused. May we bring them hope, inviting them to this service, even online, but also praying for them and writing to them and calling them as their neighbor. And so, Lord, we pray this as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, as you and I do now. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Eat this in remembrance of me. This is my body, broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of a risen Lord until he returns. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
And after everyone had eaten, Jesus prayed. Lord God, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for providing for us. And we thank you for watching over us in sovereignty and power. We ask you to be our ruler, our leader, our Messiah, our Savior and friend. In your name we pray. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let choice to make. We can choose to turn away from Jesus or to change our direction and follow him. I encourage you to go now in the love, power, and hope of the good news of the Jesus message. Lift up those who have fallen down. Return no one evil for evil. But go in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.